message from 2020, which this outline is uh, produced, uh, is available or will be tomorrow. I, th I think it already is online. For those of you that would like to see it, I encourage you to see it because um, I think that we went to great lengths uh, to, to have a couple of Sundays four years ago to really explain why being pro-life is so important. And then the second message, which we'll have online the following week, and I'm not going to preach on that next week, but we will also give you the outlines of the second message, uh, which was about how to live it out, how Christians can live out this message um, of being pro-life. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think two of the most misunderstood terms uh, as this is discussed politically is the term pro-choice and pro-life. Um, pro-life is misunderstood to be about abortion when the fact of the matter is that pro-life is pro-life in all of its forms. Uh, we, we don't support euthanasia. We don't support the um, eradication of the mentally ill. Or uh, we, we, there, there's so many things that we do not support because we believe it is not pro-life. We believe that every life has value. We believe that every life has purpose. And on the other hand, uh, I don't believe, and I, my intention is not to be offensive but we don't believe that pro-choice is an accurate term because most of the time, I would say the vast majority of the time, people that describe themselves as pro-choice, they're not pro-choice, they're pro-abortion. Uh, if they were pro-choice, they would say, well, this is our choice and you feel free to have your choice, but we don't, uh, they don't want us to have our choice. We are vilified, we are, uh, our, our intelligence is questioned, our motive is questioned, our patriotism is questioned. Um, this is not about a, 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 an honest disagreement on what would be a political issue. This is about these, this idea of pro-abortion or pro-life is driven by a spiritual force. And anytime we try to treat it as less than that, we're going to run into trouble. Uh, you say, well, we, we, we know that, uh, you know, abortion is wrong. I cannot tell you how many times from this church I've heard from people, I know abortion is wrong, but I, I want you to understand, loved ones, there is no moral equivalency to abortion. There's no moral equivalency to abortion. You don't say, well, this has happened, and, but abortion, you know, it, it, this is just as bad as abortion. Baloney. Absolute baloney. There is no moral equivalency. And I guess I'm maybe digging myself into a hole to begin with today. But um, I think the same spirit that drives abortion is the spirit that drives um, or that drove slavery, or that drives slavery around the world today, the spirit that drove slavery here in America. Uh, the idea that one is less than another, one is of less value than another, that's what is at the heart of it. And I want to tell you there was a movement, even among the churches during the Civil War, to justify, to justify slavery everything from it gives the slaves a better life uh, or it introduces slaves to the gospel. And I, I, I want to tell you that even the Supreme Court uh, basically has done what our Supreme Court did. Thankfully, it's been undone and referred back to the states. But the Supreme Court said a slave is not the same as a free man. He's worth less. Uh, in fact, and it's not just been the way that blacks were treated. It was true of the Indians. I was reading a book the other day and I found that a man that was responsible for the murder of several uh, Native Americans went to court charged with their death, but not charged with murder. He was charged with cruelty to animals. So loved ones, what I'm saying is if we lived in 1860, 
instead of 2024, we would not stand, we would not stand for the arguments that minimized slavery and said it's not that bad. It, it, we ended up at war over it. I saw a t-shirt years ago and, and you know, I'm a, I'm a Southern boy. I showed you my legs one day. I'm a white boy. Um, um, and my great, great, great grandfather fought in the Army of Northern Virginia. I, I'm, I'm not coming from some sheltered or uh, ambivalent background. I mean, my family came through that just like most of your families came through that. Well, probably all of your families came from it, through it unless you're from another nation or something. But uh, um, I saw a t-shirt that was, I think, almost an apology. I think almost an apology. Had a Confederate flag uh, on the chest and then it had in big letters, wrong about slavery. And then in big letters underneath the flag, but right about everything else. And I understood what that store owner was trying to communicate. He, he was trying to say, yeah, slavery, slavery was, was wrong and we shouldn't have supported slavery. But we were right about everything else. Uh, meaning the, the reasons for se secession. And you know what? That may be true. That, that may be true. Even then, the original causes of the Civil War, uh, slavery was always there. It was always dealt with, even though it wasn't overtly named as the cause to begin with. It was, it was, um, it was the idea of big government against small government. It was the idea of states' rights in a good way, not a bad way. Uh, and you might say, well, the, the states did have the right to secede. And um, y you might be right, but the problem is the South did not, and I'm, I'm a son of the South, but the South did not have the moral fiber to say this is wrong. They, they said all of this is being done to us, and because this is being done to us, we're, we're, we're willing to go to war. Um, they, they, they never said this is wrong. If they could have separated the two things, I don't think war would have ever needed to have happened. But you see, you can't say, um, yes, yeah, slavery's wrong, but so is all this other stuff. But then I notice that's exactly what the church does today. The church is doing the same thing in 2020 to 24 as American did, even the American church did in 1861 and really back into the 50s. The church is saying, well, this is wrong, but so is all of this. And unless we can get this dealt with, we're not going to worry about this. I talked to a friend a few years ago before he died, very successful, a, a household word and I said, is there, what's the thing that you regret? I, we had talked about victories. What's the thing that you regret? And he teared up and he was a little older than me. And he talked about a period of time where I was a child, the civil rights movement of the 60s. And um, there was never any kind of bias bone in his body that I knew of, nothing prejudicial at all. But he began to cry and he said, I should have marched with black pastors and their churches during the Civil War struggle because what they had faced was wrong and they needed my support. And I said, well, why didn't you? I, being a child, I thought maybe there was something I was missing. He said, I never understood that these things that were done wrong here were never equal to what had been done to black Americans. He said, we're wrong, but so are they. We shouldn't have done this, but they shouldn't have done that. And loved ones, we blew it <laughs> at the Civil War. 
We, we, we had a war that killed directly from war, 600,000 people, considering uh, a disease that shortened life and all of that. Numbers say that it was closer to 2 million people that died. And I think those numbers are right. I'm coming to you today because uh, even holy men made a case for slavery in the Civil War. The Southern Baptist movement, I'm not picking on them. To their credit, they have repented and they have apologized and they have said it was wrong. But the Southern Baptists came into existence separating from the rest of the Baptists that said slavery should not exist. And the Southern Baptist movement, one of the, one of the greatest soul winning movements in America was founded in the idea of slavery is wrong, but so is this other stuff. And they held to slavery. Loved ones, I am sta standing here today to give a warning to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever may hear me. I'm standing here giving a warning to Christian life and whoever will hear me. And we have to understand the responsibility that we have. I'm talking, you know, I'm, I'm representing your future pastor. I'm representing future generations. And I want you to know that the thing that threw me more than anything in my ministry was the idea that it wasn't that important to so many people. And this is wrong, but so is this. This needs to be done, but so does this. And loved ones, we have to take care of business beginning with the top down. And I believe that there is judgment on our nation because of abortion, just like I believe there was judgment on our nation because of slavery. I believe that the church in large measure has failed with so many issues and, and we are about to begin to reap persecution because of it if things don't change in society. And we need to understand that the question before us today is not about this political point or that political point or that political point or even that one. The thing that's before us today is what are we going to do with the sacrifice of our children to the God Molech? It has to be dealt with. You can't, there's no moral equivalency. As I said, it has to be dealt with. And I want you to know that um, we say, well, we can, if we could just get justice, we could fix it. We do need justice. The kingdom of God is built on justice and righteousness. That's the foundation of the kingdom, justice and righteousness. But loved ones, I want you to understand this, that justice without the righteousness of God is just as bad as injustice. Injustice is horribly wrong, but justice with the brand of man on it instead of the brand of God may be just as devastating. And so that's why we've got to understand that the way we're handling injustices in our society, we take an injustice and then we just choose a different injustice. Uh, it, it, we, we say this was done, so vengeance is the course we need to take. And there's no justice that's being done because we have kicked God out of our society in many circles and we are saying we can handle this. We can fix this. We can make things right. And all we're doing is creating an intensity of hatred and vitriol and venom and something's got to happen where the church stands up and becomes the church again. Now, I was so distracted. I, I only mentioned this because I want to put it in context for you. I'm not whining. I'm really not. I've, I've learned my lesson. I got over my hurt. And I realized that God was teaching me something that I had to learn in order to go forward into my latter years. 
But when I talk about 2020 and the message that we preached in January, it was not, uh, I, I was so excited. I said, we, we have turned a corner today. But between COVID, social unrest, restrictions, uh, uh, forced isolation and, you know, churches can't meet in certain places. I mean, it, it all collapsed. And my attitude was that uh, within six weeks of that victory, it was all washed away. It was all washed away. Abortion was not even on the horizon anymore. And I was, and then I, I went through a period of time where I, nothing I said was said the right way. I, I'm exact. That's, that was my perception. That was not true. Uh, you loved me and you loved each other. And this church did a phenomenal job of surviving. And we, we did survive. And we thank the leadership for that. We thank your tenacity for that. But I want you to know not everybody stayed. Not everybody survived. Uh, not everybody was nice, you know. Uh, you know, and it, it was not a pretty time. And it was the only time in my ministry, the only time in my ministry, and, and this is my fault. I'm not blaming anybody else. But it was the only time in my ministry where I said, I'm done. Now, now I've said that a lot of times on Monday morning. <laughs> but it lasts about 20 minutes. And I'm under conviction within 90 seconds. And I know I don't mean it. You know, I know I don't mean it. You know, I, 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 years ago, Ramona asked me when we'd go to council or we'd go to general council or some conference. She said, why do you always want to sit in the back? You always tell people to, 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 to sit, you know, get under the, the spout where the glory comes out. You always tell people to move forward. You, you you always sit in the back and you always leave five minutes early. Why do you do that? I said, I just want to know what these people feel that do this every week. They leave early. They sit in the back. No offense to you sitting in the back. But in those days, it was just, I just, I just want to know what they feel. Is it really worth it? You know, and that was a joke, but you're not laughing. So let's move on to something else. You guys need to straighten up and get with it here. But this didn't last for two hours. This lasted for about six weeks. I, I said, I'm, I'm done. The Lord would speak to me and I said, Lord, you know, I'll pass this on. But I'm done. I, 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 can, I, can I just tell you how whiny I was? I said, I deserve better than this. I deserve better than this letter. I deserve better than this email or phone call or whatever. And I only say that not because I've got a chip on my shoulder. I, honestly, I have worked through that. But it honestly took me a while. And it, it honestly took me about six weeks before I quit saying I'm through. I'm done. Uh, I only told my wife at that point. And uh, I tell you to say it was a tough time for all of us. It was a tough time for all of us. And I'm so glad I stayed. I'm so glad you didn't run me off. I'm so thankful to be the pastor of this church. All of that changed. But out of that flood of stuff in 2020, the church seemed to be, I mean, the church world seemed to be just blown back and forth. And, and it was like we were trying to decide where are we going to settle on this, uh, on all sorts of things. And the thing that seemed most obvious to me is the victory won in abortion was lost within six months. Uh, and I came to the point a few months ago, I said, Lord, as we approach the sanctity of human life Sunday, I feel like I need to address it again. And, and anybody that attends here knows we're, we're pro-life. But I feel like I need to just do some explaining again. And I said, so I, if I'm hearing you right, I want to take Sanctity of Human Life Sunday and readdress this. And um, that's what I intended to do. But I felt like God was doing something that I didn't understand. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm willing to replant this seed all again. Re willing to replant it over and over. And uh, as I was praying... 
I really felt the Lord speak to me in a, a, a gentle, a gentle rebuke. He said, you think you've lost everything. And I said, well, the flood washed it away. I think I did. I said, people that were convinced are not convinced anymore. They, they have other agendas um, besides dealing with the, the life and death issue of abortion. And um, he said, not everything was lost. He said, some was lost. Some was washed away. He said, don't you remember the parable of the sower? That some of the seed was taken away. Some of the seed was distracted. But some seed found good ground. And you've got some seed that found good ground. And I said, Lord, I said, it's obviously not where I can see it. You're going to have to help me. I was just so whining, for, so hurt. And the Lord reminded me of something that happened one time. Um, I had, was trying to plant for, uh, uh, um, you know, an, an, an overcrop, a winter crop of grass uh, to, to help the soil and to prepare for the garden. And I had gotten the soil ready. It was a big job. I had planted the seed uh, just like the gardening manual said, I'd prepared the ground just like the manual said. I put the seed down. And they, you know, I had to pay for the seed and I did the fertilizer. I did all of that. And I put just the right layer of soil on top of the seed. I gave it some water and then it gave me a watering schedule. And it says uh, every good rain that you have after the seed is established you know, you know, you've, you've done that. And, you know, sometimes when you follow instructions, like one, one year I calculated, I had $8 in every tomato, you know. Um, but that, but you know, this, I thought I was doing this well. And um, what happened is we had a storm that came with such intensity and the seed was just beginning to sprout. And then I saw it just washed away. And I'm, I'm, I'm out there rebuking the devil, you know, and, and, and I'm saying, Lord, help me. I, I can't prove it, but I think I heard some of the seed yelling out, Farmer Steve, help us, help us. And there was nothing I could do. It was just being carried away to the neighbor's yard and down the street. And I said, well, I'm going to have to do it again. And then a few sprigs came back, but my chickens took care of them. And it was just, it was just desolate. And um, I remember a few weeks later when I was really trying to get ready to plant. See, because I'd planned to use that. Uh, overgrowth for feeding the chickens and rabbits and things like that. So I go out and I get the land ready, uh, or that's what I intended to do. And I had hay that was just spread out that had kind of been dropped while I was feeding the animals through the winter or whatever. And I said, okay, first thing I got to do is sweep this stuff up, haul it off. And as I began to, to sweep the hay, it was like something I thought, it was either Bigfoot or it was rabbits had gotten under there and they were holding this hay down, you know, I, and I had to get down and pull. And you know what I found out is that everywhere the hay was, the seed had washed under there. And when I got the hay up, there was a growth about this big, thick, luscious, green grass. And I looked at it and wanted, you know, if anybody had been around, I'd have said, I planned it this way. You know. <laughs> and the Lord reminded me of that. He said, I've always spoken to you about remnant. He says, the enemy is efficient at washing things away. The enemy is efficient at planting wheat uh, or planting tares with the wheat. He said, look at what was growing and you didn't even know it. He said, and, and this is going to spread 
through the rest of the area. Just keep the chickens out, but this is going to spread through the rest of the area. And your original goal is going to happen. And it pretty well did. And the Lord spoke to me. He says, that's what's happening in your church with the issue of abortion. He said, there are a lot of people that got distra uh, distracted. Uh, there are people that may be blind. There may be people that spiritually have had blunt force trauma to their spiritual head. There are those that are just carrying burdens. There are some that are double sold. But he said, the victory that you felt in 2024, he says, you're uncover. He says, you're about to uncover the grass. You're about to uncover what you thought was lost. And I'm going to do significant things. And I think that's what today is about. And I want you to know that we believe it is time. One of the things, and God has been so gracious, even with my whining and my pettiness, God has been so gracious to take us through these four years. And so much good has happened. So much has uh, been manifested uh, that we didn't initially see. I told you that even things that are concerning us have turned out to be a blessing. We, because we have live stream services, which we're glad we're, we do, but you know what, you know what live stream services do? You no longer know how many people you have in the church. Churches, that's their number one, you know, metric. How many people do we have? And we, we know in person, we know in person, we have close to a thousand on a Sunday and we're thankful for that. But there's reasons to believe that we have more than that, perhaps far more than that, that are online. You say, well, well I wish we could get those numbers so we could, could celebrate. I think God is in the business right now of just keeping things from us. So we will just celebrate him and not what he does. I, I really think it's God that we don't know how big our church is. Uh, but I'm, I'm surprised that my mother-in-law's funeral, and thank you so much for your care and the cards and your prayers. I should have said that to, to start with. You've been so gracious to my wife and, and me and, and the family. Uh, thank you so much. But I, I found that there were several dozen people that I had no idea that are regular listeners here, just in my family. The same thing happened at my brother's funeral. Same thing happened at Terry's funeral. Man, we, we probably got people running around that we, we, we have no idea who they are. So I'm thankful for that. But I've had to learn that some of the things God does aren't to our liking. At least the way he does it is not to our liking. And we've got to understand that it's up to us to understand what God is doing, join hands with him. Now in this message, uh, which I'm, I'm not gonna go over, I tried to do it first service, but I, I preached a third of it. That's not what I want to do. Um, the message, and, and you've got, I, I said manuscript, it's kind of a loose manuscript, it's not word for word. But we dealt with four things. We said that we want to deal with um, potential misconceptions. We didn't want people to under, misunderstand why I was preaching it, nor did we want people to understand why it was such a burden for me to preach. Um, a, a, a pastor doesn't like bringing people to the table and saying, you need to repent. Pastor doesn't like doing that. If he does, he's not the kind of pastor you want in your church. I'd find another church. I, I've got enough issues in life without going to church and have the pastor slap me back and forth uh, during the day. That, that's not the way I pastor. And I don't think a person that does that has a pastor's heart. Uh, let's keep going. A pastor wants everybody, like we've always said, he wants to get everybody from Sears to Dillard's. He wants everybody to be part of the process and, and it troubles a pastor when he hurts his congregation. And a lot of times people that, that want to encourage me and help me say, don't, don't be afraid. Don't, I, I, don't, don't ever hold back from preaching God's word. Loved ones, you've got to understand, and I can say this fully about Corey as well, it would never enter our mind to hold back from preaching God's word. 
It, it would terrify us to think that we were standing up here not in obedience to the Lord. That's not what concerns people like me and Corey. What concerns us is that when we have delivered a difficult message, we want the congregation to still know that we love them and that we're in this together. So I talked about potential misconceptions. I talked about who I was talking to and not talking to. You, you just need to listen to the message to understand. We didn't spend that Sunday talking about the victims of abortion. We didn't talk, spend that Sunday talking about people that had been lied to and are misled. We wanted to heal. Then we talked about the roots of abortion, that it's a satanic design it's a satanic design. And you see its first roots begin to appear in Genesis 3. And um, we traced the history of child sacrifice in the Roman Empire, like the video did today, in the nation of Israel and what child uh, sacrifice was like. Um, then we talked about the core issue. We said that the core issue of uh, abortion really revolves around when does life begin? And there is nothing that's, that has been lied about anymore in American culture than the idea of when life begins. We don't know. Science, when you go to, to pure science, science has a heavy bias toward life begins at conception. That's when life begins. But science spokespeople are not sharing that. And political people are not sharing that. I remember a presidential debate a few years ago and one candidate was asked, when do you believe that life begins? He said, at the moment of conception. And, you know, he got some scattered applause. And the other candidate was asked, when do you believe life begins? And he took uh, the, this humble approach and says, oh, that's way above my, my pay grade. I don't know when life begins, way above my pay grade. Uh, but then when that person became president, he became a staunch advocate for abortion. If he really thought it was uh, beyond his pay grade, he should have at least stopped and investigated some of the questions that were put. But they don't do that. They, they, like I said, it is not pro-choice. It is pro-abortion. And there is nothing more unfairly represented in America today than the core issue of when life begins. Now you say, well, there's this study and there's that study. Yeah, and everything that I've enjoyed eating at one time or another has been declared cancer causing through my life. And now the cycle is complete. Now I'm supposed to eat a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, I, guys, I'm saying that there is science that is our friend. And then there is what Paul called in the text, science so-called. And usually science so-called is science interpreted by people that are non-scientists. Um, that's why I tell you, don't get your theology from the History Channel. Don't get your worldview from Discovery. Now, I watch both of those channels. I love them. But, um, you know, somebody that has this crazy idea is called an expert or a scholar. Do you know that you can't even define a scholar? A scholar has no, well, if you do this, you're a scholar. Or if you do this, you're a scholar. Or if you do this, you're an expert. Or if you have a doctor in front of your name, you know everything there is to know. Loved ones, I believe in higher education. I have a doctorate. But I want to tell you, you get a doctorate because you did a project. And you, did a, you got a doctorate because you took some extra classes. And we, we need to understand that there is only one true source of truth. <laughs> There's only one absolute source of truth, and it's the Word of God. You say, well, that's, that's offensive to a logical mind. It's because the Bible transcends logical mind. It's not opposed to logic. It's not logic or faith. Logic or faith. No, whatever logic's opposite is, is here. But Scripture transcends. It goes above everything. And it's a matter of faith. We've said it before. The Bible gives us enough information to make our faith intelligent. But it withholds enough information to give our faith room to grow. And faith does not 
Uh, I, I believe that before all is over, faith will be fully vindicated by science and by logic. But that's only going to happen when Jesus comes. And we, 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 we need to understand that um, if there's a question of when life starts, I, I don't think there is, but I'm not a scientist. If there is a question, if, if, if that presidential candidate was right, I just don't know when life begins, then you need to have the common sense to take a cautious path and say, I, life may begin at conception, so I need to be careful. But what the world is doing is says, we don't know when life begins, so let's just kill everything uh, in, in concern, concerning the womb. Charles Krauthammer, who I really liked, he was a uh, commentator, uh, uh, conservative scholar, um, he, not a Christian as far as I know. He was Jewish in his heritage. I don't even know if he was a religious Jew. I don't know. But Charles Krauthammer, um, when asked, why do you oppose abortion? And he said, well, there's several reasons that are the, you know, the ones we would embrace. He says, but the fact of the matter is, I don't know when life begins. Now, he's, he's a psychiatrist. He's a medical doctor. He said, I don't know when life begins. So I must not involve myself in anything that might potentially take innocent life. And then he made an example. He said, if we were demolishing a building downtown... He said, we, after we had all the building wired and all the bombs set to explode and the charges set to go off, we would issue warnings. We would sweep the building floor by floor and room by room to be sure there was no life. No life. And only after we were certain that there was no life in the building would we detonate. If there was even a suspicion that there was life somewhere in the building, a shadow on a wall, a glimmer of light. He said, what we always do is we stop and say, we will not go forward with this until we verify there is no life. And abortion does just the opposite. In your notes, you have examples of the way children were offered to idols in the Old Testament. And there's also a couple of descriptions of abortion clinic procedures that are modern day. And loved ones, in the, we, we, again, we won't take time to go through all of that. Um, we do want to talk about, uh, we said the roots of abortion. When does life begin? We talked about the Jewish culture. There's a place that we talk about, you're going to hear more about in just a moment, but it's the idea of sled, sled. This is how we determine when life begins. Sled, um, the S-L-E-D, that's not the law enforcement group. Sled, the S stands for size. They say, well, the, the child is so small that it couldn't be human, but we're... A, a small person's not of less value than a tall person. Uh, men are generally bigger than women, generally. So does that make women less than men? Um, a a four-year-old is smaller than a 10-year-old, but does that make a four-year-old of less value than a 10-year-old? Um, the, the L has to do with level of development. Um, uh, babies in the womb are less developed than an adult, but a newborn baby is less developed than a four-year-old. A four-year-old girl is less developed than a 14-year-old girl. In, in fact, we, we, we are constantly developing until we reach that place of of maturity, but at no point would we say this person is small um, uh, or this person um, is not fully developed yet. Let's get rid of them. No, we do everything we can to grow them and to preserve them and protect them. The E is environment. And they say, well, not until they're born are they a baby. Before that, they're just tissue. Well, let me ask you this. If, if you sleep on the right side of the bed and then you roll over to the left side of the bed, have you changed? 
I mean, no, you're the same. So your environment doesn't have anything to do with your validity as a human being. But what pro-abortionists tell us is that there's something that happens when this mass of tissue is in the woman's body, it's a mass of tissue. And when you understand what full-term abortion and these other things, it, it, we're not just talking about six-week babies. We're talking about fully developed babies. We're talking about babies that could easily survive outside the womb on their own. Um, when, when, when they're in the mother's body, they are just a blob for all intents and purposes. But there's a travel of about eight inches down the birth canal and suddenly they're fully human. I want to know what magical thing is in that birth canal that turns them from a blob to Bob. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. Um, and then the D is degree of dependency. Um, they say that a baby's not a baby until it can depend, until it can exist on its own outside the womb. I want to tell you, there's not a baby born that can exist outside the womb on his own. They, they will die within hours if they're not taken up and cared for. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, the, the degree of dependence does not make a person human or make them unhuman. Because a baby is born, mom and daddy have to do everything. Have to do everything. I mean, there's, there's no pride in that baby. The baby never says, excuse me, I, I need to go to the restroom. <laughs> I remember one precious lady from my home church. Um, when I preached her funeral years ago and I, I just smiled all the way through because she was telling me that uh, I was depressed about something and if you're not careful, you'll make a wrong decision. I was just a young man and uh, in my early 20s and she said, you need to be careful now. Don't let depression gra drive you. And I thought, I'm the seminary graduate. I'm the man of God. I, I don't need this lady. I mean, in my mind, I would never say that. And I said, well, I think I'm doing okay. And she pointed at me and said, Steve Chetty, don't you talk back to me. Remember, I changed your diapers. And that was, that was her way of saying, I've seen you at your most vulnerable. You know, I, and I was dependent, but I was a human. Uh, let me tell you something. The older you get, you're going to begin to wonder if you are as dependent on yourself as you think you are. And, but you're not less human. And, um, there's a quote from uh, the case for equipping Christians. Um, and I, I conclude the message by saying abortion, abortion and infanticide are nothing less than issues of sin and immorality. Now, um, you, I, I can't do that justice. Please watch it online. And then, as I said, next week we'll have, uh, I'm not preaching this next week, but we'll have the second sermon uh, available to you as well. Um, I guess I need to stop, but there's one more thing that will be such a blessing to you. It's um, going to be uh, performed. Oh, there was something I needed to give you numbers. No. Never mind, it, that'll take us too far along. Um, there's something uh, I want you to see. It's a, it's a thing called Spoken Word by Grace Black. And uh, we welcome her back home to do this for us today. She's coming. But um, right now, I want you to listen to this presentation. Just three or four or five minutes. But it will put a thinking person's mind in the right place. Okay? Bless you. Our culture blurs the lines between opinion and what's true. And I try to keep an open mind so I can learn something new. But one thought that makes my blood absolutely boil is the thought that anyone could take the life of an unborn child. 
So you can have your thoughts and you can have your opinions, but when those thoughts cause the deaths of millions of innocent little children, I cannot keep quiet. Their blood cries out to the Lord in silence. Now, I'm not the judge, and I have no right to condemn. And hear me when I say I'm not out to offend, but here are four reasons that that child in the womb is no different in value than me or you. Remember the acronym SLED, S-L-E-D. The first letter is S. S stands for size. One of the only differences between you, me, and that child is the size of our bodies. But you wouldn't take my life if I were five inches shorter than you, 10 inches shorter than you, 60 inches shorter than you. A child's value lies not in his size. He is still precious enough to die for in God's eyes. The second letter is L. L is for level of development. That itty bitty baby isn't fully grown yet, but neither is a 12 year old. Would you take his life? Why is it different for an unborn child? No one's worth is determined by their maturity. So why would a fetus's development make us treat him or her any differently? The third letter is E. E is for environment. The world looks different from that baby's perspective, but I hope you'd agree that I'm no different here than I am here. The process of birth is just a matter of inches, remember. No one's significance rests on their location, and in the case of abortion, there is no exception. The fourth and final letter is D. D is for a degree of dependency. A fetus is at the mercy of his or her mother completely, but since when has a man's price tag been his level of independence? While we were still helpless in sin, Christ died for each one of us. The dependent and needy are not inconveniences. Every human life is a blessing from heaven. Size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency. These four items are the only differences between you, me, and any unborn child. So I hope that you see why I take this issue so very, very seriously. Now our God gives redemption and our God gives hope. So if abortion is part of your story, I want you to know that your story is not over. But you of all people should understand the weight of holding a child's life in our hands. The unborn in our nation have no voice, so I cannot remain silent. I have no choice but to speak for them. So don't bury your head in the sand. Get up. Speak out. It's time to take a stand. Thank you.